Welcome to episode 49 of The Brainstorm. We're talking Telegram and the Ton Network and whether or not Moore's Law is dead or alive. Everyone loves to debate it. We've got one of ARK's crypto experts, Lorenzo. Lorenzo, what is the history of Telegram and Ton? Is this the ICO to rise from the ashes? Yeah, I mean, it seems so. Uh, Ton, um, the Ton network is a layer one blockchain. Uh, they launched uh, in early 2018. So this was the very tail end of the, the ICO bubble. And so they raised $1.7 billion. Um, and shortly after that, the SEG deemed the, um, the sale uh, illegal. And so, you know, the partnership between Telegram and Ton, uh, they basically had to severe the relationship. And so Ton uh, continued to be run as a community-led initiative until late last year. And this was kind of a surprise and why, you know, activity has been surging a lot. Uh, at the end of last year, I think it was October, uh, Telegram and the Ton network uh, co-announced co uh, jointly a new a self-custodial wallet between the two of them. And so it has reignited uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, interest, uh, I would say, among user investors and and you know the crypto community broadly. Uh, so yeah, that, that's been kind of the the history up up until now for for Ton. And so they're just allowed to repartner, and the SEC is going to be okay with this, or what are the implications there? Yeah, I mean, we actually don't have like a lot of uh, a lot of insight into kind of the regulatory, you know, background uh, of this. And I think it's one of the main reasons this caught kind of everybody off guard, uh, you know, the new relationship between uh, both products. Um, I think like Pavel Durov, the CEO, uh, you know, he's very focused on, you know, growing Telegram and, you know, very very focused on human rights, privacy. And so uh, from a technology perspective, uh, you know, crypto and blockchain in general, especially for payments, make a lot, a lot of sense. Um, so, yeah, but regulatory wise, uh, yeah, it's been now more than two and a half years. Uh, and uh, we, we don't know exactly why they, they've uh, been allowed to re-engage. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's been a really, really interesting story for the past six to eight months, I would say. Lorenzo, curious what you think Telegram's role will be in the future of Ton here. They have a massive distribution. So curious what you think about Telegram, crypto on Telegram, and now Ton in Telegram. Yeah, I mean, it's been kind of the, the, the main uh, story here for, for Ton, just the, the raw size of, uh, of Telegram. Uh, Telegram is the fourth largest messaging app in the world after WeChat uh, Facebook Messenger and, and WhatsApp, they're going to close their year, I think, at over a billion uh, users. Uh, and so I think for for crypto in general, um, Telegram is like a very crypto native uh, messaging app, uh, even before these announcements. If you work in crypto, you're an analyst or VC, um, a business that you work in business development at some crypto, crypto project or even in marketing like you have to interact with with uh, with Telegram. Uh, most of the activity uh, for crypto is either on Twitter or Telegram. So it's a very crypto native uh, app. Uh, and so I think the the partnership is really interesting. We've never seen that size of distri you know the, of distribution. Uh, we've seen you know base with Coinbase. Coinbase has a bit more than a hundred million I think monthly uh, accounts, uh, and I think fifteen million um, monthly active users. Binance with the Binance Smart Chain is, um, you know, an experiment that I would call pretty similar. And, and Binance also has uh, a few uh, hundred million uh, users. But Telegram is definitely, you know, on its own in its own league. And so I think it's very be, it's going to be very interesting, especially from uh, micro payments and, you know, viral, small viral apps like, uh, um, you know, and it, like gaming uh, or, um, you know, trading, the, the ton network is very cheap. Uh, and, you know, open that to potentially, um, you know, a billion people. Uh, I think, um, you know, we could see like activity, TVL, and basically all the metrics continue uh, 
um, to, to, to skyrocket like in the next, in the next months. And maybe as a last question here, if they do this, do you think this gives them an edge over those other messaging apps? Like will people switch over to this because it will have more capability with the ton network? Um, so, uh, when you say other messaging apps, like which one, for example, uh, uh, some that the crypto community is using right now that it's not telegram or, or Valor, like the, the, just the, the user base, like in the world, user base in the world, right? Like, are people going to say, Oh, like, why am I using WhatsApp? I can switch over telegram, use some interesting payments or gaming, anything like yeah. that. I mean, I think the, the user base is, you know, is, is different. Uh, the three biggest markets for Telegram, you know, are Russia, uh, India and Indonesia. And so, you know, it, it's not really the same user base as, as WhatsApp, which say is mostly like Europe and probably uh, um, the US. Uh, but I do think, um, you know, Durov, like during the, 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 last, um, the last event that took in 2049, said he was going to uh, share 50% of the ad revenue on Telegram with creator users, um, uh, uh, you know, on, on channels and groups. So I think that could potentially entice, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, in the in the, um, in the the Telegram uh, kind of ecosystem. On top of that, I think in terms of functionalities, I mean, Telegram's been pretty, um, you know, pretty rapid. Uh, you know, the number of people that you can insert in a group, uh, you know, the accelerated audios, uh, you know, a lot of privacy features. They've been kind of uh, pushing the, you know, the boundaries on that and, and pushing new features faster than WhatsApp. So I think, yeah, it's definitely possible. All right. We'll have to keep an eye on it. What is what is like the next step here to watch for? Um, I think the next step, um, one of the very interesting announcement that was done uh, a month ago uh, was, uh, you know, Tether CEO um, announcing the support uh, for Ton of USDT, their native, uh, you know, their stablecoin, which is the biggest stablecoin in crypto with, I think, hundred uh, more than 110 billion in, in, in supply. Uh, and so I think that is a big, big enabler. Um, before that, they had, they didn't have a native stablecoin. They had a lot of wrapped versions, uh, but, uh, you know, they're more risky, like market makers don't really want to use them and you can't really, you know, grow liquidity around like wrapped stable coins. So I think with that, you know, you can see potentially uh, increasing, you know, micropayments with USDT. Um, they're building nice, you know, DeFi primitives uh, with, with DEXs, money markets. And so I think you need like a, a strong stable coin. Uh, so, yeah, I think like the, the next thing to watch is just um, growth in TVL and activity on some of these these DeFi apps. All right. Amazing. Lorenzo, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Lorenzo. No, it was a pleasure. Okay. Sam, Moore's Law, is it dead? I'm going to flip that back to you, Nick. Do you think it's dead? No. After I read your piece. Oh, wow. wow, wow. Yeah, you've convinced um, me. But I'd say, so right, Moore's Law, doubling in transistors in every you know, 18 to 24 months has held up. But about 10 years ago, people started talking about the death of Moore's Law. And it certainly seemed to be dead, I would say, or slowing. Um, and this comes into, I know everyone's going to be shocked, Wright's Law. Nick, what is Wright's Law? Sam, I'm going to kick that one back to you as your known internally as Mr. Wright's Law. Yes, I think yes, you've yes. used it the most out of anyone uh, in ARC. It is. So every cumulative doubling in production, you get a fixed percent cost decline. And there have actually been studies showing that uh, Wright's Law would have done a better job at predicting semiconductor cost declines than Moore's Law would have. Uh, and it's certainly been true for other industries as well. But so I think this is where it gets interesting because Wright's law um, goes by cumulative doubling of production as opposed to time-based, which means that if you cross over a new tipping point in demand, you can see a reacceleration on a year-over-year cost decline basis, right? And so the example that I pointed to here as kind of a parallel 
is with batteries, right? And so you had decades of battery cost declines. And then as the market was really reaching high numbers, I'd say, with uh, consumer electronics, it became harder and harder to cumulatively double production. And so you had a flatlining of battery costs in like the 20, I'll say like the 2014 era. And people said, you know, look at year over year cost declines, they flattened out, battery costs aren't going to happen. Or battery cost declines aren't going to happen, EVs aren't going to happen. Then all of a sudden, they got to just the point where you could have a compelling electric vehicle. And then you had an EV with thousands of times more battery than a smartphone. And then you saw a reacceleration in battery cost declines. And so I think something similar is happening here with uh, semiconductors, right? And it's like, you, you know, death of Moore's law, but all of a sudden there's this huge, huge new application. People are spending billions and billions of dollars on um, AI training chips. And so we, in theory, should see this reacceleration in cost declines. But then this is where the work of Frank and Joseph come in, right? Because uh, another nuance here is you have to measure the right thing. Cumulative doubling of what? Right. If you for batteries, if you said of battery cells, right, like that's not the right thing to measure. Right. You want to measure kilowatt hours. And so maybe transistors isn't even the right thing that we should be measuring. Right. And so Joseph and Frank put out in big ideas this past year. And I think we can get the chart shown here. But, you know, they take both the hardware side and the software improvements to come up with a uh, AI relative compute unit. And so they sh they're showing that with measuring this, you can actually lay out a uh, Wright's law curve where the training costs should continue to fall 75% per year because you're taking into account not just that hardware cost decline, but also that... Um, software and algorithm algorithmic model enhancement side interesting i'm i think we're seeing one that play out year over year now i think the numbers we got in for 23 were around that figure and i think it is primarily due to software at least that's what we're hearing from companies on the hardware side you know where we're really seeing advancements or you know, efficiencies is in software and training capability. Um, so I do think, you know, this is just a, the start of a new, as you put it, reacceleration in cost decline for AI and compute. And then maybe a bigger point there is it's like, that's why it's so important for, uh, I guess, general purpose technology platforms to cut across sector, right? Because if there's not a broad, based demand, then you can get pigeonholed and you have less surface area to reach these new tipping points to induce new demand. So, right, if batteries were only good for cell phones, then you can only have so many cell phones and then you get cost flatlining. But the fact that they can be used for transportation, you get this huge tipping point. The fact that it can be used for stationary energy storage you get another end market and, you know, it's hard to predict, you know, from day one, what those new industries will be. Um, but having it be cross sector increases that probability of success for these underlying platforms. And we think AI is the probably as a technology platform, the one that cuts across the most sectors. I mean, I think we've talked about this on the show, but I think when you look at the next five, 10 years and see how AI plays out, it becomes similar to how the internet played out as in, you know, every company today is probably an internet company at its heart or uses the internet to facilitate their business. And I think it's going to be the same with AI. So I think it's, we're in kind of this unique stage where we're calling certain companies, this is an AI company, this is an AI company. But the reality is every company is going to use AI and every company will be an AI company, either enabled by it 
or building it, using it in some capacity. It seems like that's the trajectory we're heading for. Yeah. And it is interesting because I did, I brought this up in brainstorm, right? And it's like, you don't call every computer company an electricity company because it's using electricity, right? But there was an electricity, like General Electric was an electricity company that was brought up by Brett, right? So like in the early days, you can have like the flagship company that is that thing, but 100% agree with your point. It's like, you know, maybe we look back in three years and it's just like, okay, everything has AI somewhere in it, but are we calling this, you know, I don't know, random SaaS company, a AI company, or is it still just SaaS company in X vertical using AI? Right. Yeah. And I think to your point too, right, there are companies that are going to be pure play AI companies, you know, in the private space, you have open AI. I don't think you can call it anything other than an AI company, but every company is going to use tools and services powered by AI, either built internally or they're paying for it in some capacity, they're going to be using AI. So every company will touch it and it will enhance business operations. All right, Nick, how are you feeling ahead of next week's big number five zero? What do what are you going to do? You're feeling good. You're feeling, feeling good. good. 50 episodes in. I haven't gotten maybe. sick of you yet. <laughs> there we go. We're, we're almost at one year, but 50 is a rounder number. So we'll do something special next. Week. Yeah. Hopefully get a special guest on. We'll have to get it approved, but we'll see. That's right. If only there is a special guest we knew. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. See you next week. See you next week.